10 amino acid units in it. Now angiotensin is produced when angiotensinogen is acted on by renin. So renin facilitates the conversion of inactive angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. But actually even angiotensin 1 is not that active a molecule. But angiotensin 1 can be converted into another molecule called angiotensin 2. Angiotensin type 2. Now angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2 by an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE. Angiotensin converting enzyme. And this takes place as the blood passes through the lungs. The angiotensin converting enzyme is produced in the, um, the, the linings of the blood vessels in the lungs. Now angiotensin, angiotensin converting enzyme acts on angiotensin 1 to facilitate its conversion to angiotensin type 2. You may have come across drugs called angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors work by inhibiting the activity of the angiotensin converting enzyme. So let's re review what's happened. The kidney is hypoperfused, that's detected. The kidney responds by producing renin. Renin facilitates the conversion of inactive angiotensinogen, a plasma protein, into angiotensin type 1. Now angiotensin type 1 is mildly active, but angiotensin type 2 is much more active. Angiotensin type 2 is actually just a smaller peptide unit that actually contains eight amino acids. Now, what does angiotensin type 2 do? Well, the first thing it does is it causes arterial vasoconstriction. Arterial vasoconstriction. If you vasoconstrict the arterioles, if they get smaller, you will increase peripheral resistance and that will result in increasing blood pressure because blood pressure equals cardiac output times peripheral resistance. And angiotensin 2 is a very, very potent vasoconstrictor. It is a very effective vasoconstrictor, so it can raise blood pressure really quite a lot. Actually, as well as vasoconstricting the arterioles, angiotensin 2 will venoconstrict a little bit. If you get a venoconstriction, that increases the pressure in the veins of the body, and that increases the amount of blood which is going back to the heart. It improves venous return to the heart. If there's more blood going back to the heart, the heart has more blood to pump out. Therefore, it can increase cardiac output. But the main mechanism in terms of vasoconstriction is, is the arterioles. As well as that, angiotensin type 2 is a very, very powerful stimulator of thirst. The patient becomes very, very thirsty. You may have noticed this in patients that are shocked, that, that they can be incredibly thirsty. And normally it's good to give them water to drink, normally, unless they're being prepared for surgery. So it stimulates thirst. So the patient will drink, the water will be absorbed into the blood, this will increase intravascular volume, that will increase venous return, venous return will allow an increase in cardiac output. So thirst is good because the individual will drink, therefore increasing blood pressure 
via the mechanism of increased Venus return. Angiotensin II will also increase the amount of another hormone being produced called aldosterone. So you get increased vasoconstriction, you get increased thirst, and you get increased release of the hormone aldosterone. Now aldosterone increases the reabsorption of sodium from the renal tubules. If you increase the reabsorption of sodium from the renal tubules, you will increase the amount of sodium present in the blood. So increasing the amount of aldosterone will increase the amount of sodium in the blood. Salt, remember, is sodium chloride. And sodium and uh, so sodium is salt, salt and sodium are osmotic molecules. Now what I mean by osmotic molecules is that they will attract water to themselves. So sodium will attract water. Now if there's more aldosterone, there's more sodium in the blood, that sodium will attract water to itself, therefore you will increase the amount of water in the blood. If you increase the amount of water in the blood, you're increasing the volume of the blood. If you're increasing the volume of the blood, you increase intravascular volume. If you increase intravascular volume, you're going to increase the amount of blood going back to the heart, you're going to increase venous return. If you increase venous return, the heart has more blood to pump out, therefore it can increase stroke volume, and stroke volume will increase cardiac output, because cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. If you increase cardiac output, you will increase blood pressure, because blood pressure equals cardiac output times peripheral resistance, as long as there's adequate venous return. Actually, as well as this, angiotensin acts directly on the kidney to increase the reabsorption of water and the reabsorption of sodium from the renal tubules itself. So, um, so an angiotensinogen then will, in, will vasoconstrict, increasing blood pressure, will, in, will cause thirst, increasing blood pressure, will increase the levels of aldosterone, which will also increase blood pressure. So I think you can probably see that all of these mechanisms will increase blood pressure. Phasoconstriction increases blood pressure, thirst increases blood pressure, aldosterone increases blood pressure. So the effects of the angiotensin type 2 are to increase blood pressure. If you increase blood pressure, well you're also going to increase renal perfusion. And if you increase renal perfusion, you're going to reduce the amount of renin which the kidney releases. So here we have a whole homeostatic control of blood pressure. When the blood pressure is low, it's detected in the blood flow to the kidney, and renin will increase blood pressure. When the renin has increased the blood pressure, the blood flow to the kidney will be increased. The blood pressure in the kidney will be increased again and the amount of renin that is produced will be reduced. This is called the renin-angiotensin mechanism.